They're consisting mainly of carbon dioxide with clouds of sulfuric acid. Scientists have uh, only detected rare amounts of water. Like it's, this is just like a really bad place, and it cannot sustain life. <laughs> So Venus, who was formerly regarded as goddess of love and beauty. So the question from the humanities perspective is, where do we put love and beauty when we describe the environment that for centuries was the place of it as a hellish place that cannot support life? Like, is there something going on in the cultural life that is informing our decision making that can be witnessed in this change from, you know, Botticelli's giving this expression of something that's coming out of the ancient myths, this birth of Venus, this goddess of love and beauty, this place where we can rest our thought, even poetically, to, yeah, no, Venus ain't bad. Venus is really harsh. There's nothing that can be supported there. Um, I think it gets, yeah, Euripides. Do you not see how mighty is the goddess Aphrodite? She sows and gives that love from which all we upon earth are born. This is a really dramatic shift in consciousness from really believing that there's a source in the starry world, in the planetary world, in that which we can see that inspires love in us, or really hellish, can't support life as we know it, don't go there, it's bad. So again, this is not a causal relationship, but a coincidental one. So I'm looking for the simultaneity of things. The Venera 13 mission was launched in March of 1982. The number one song on the Billboard charts in the United States at that time was My Angel is a Centerfold by the Jay Giles Band. So you could say, all right, so the goddess of love and beauty fell all the way to the centerfold of a girly magazine. Like, that's what's happening in the cultural sphere. Again, not causal, but you can say, wow, look at this. Like, we're getting this description of the goddess of love and beauty as being a really harsh environment, and this is what we're doing with love and beauty. Like there's something happening that maybe they belong to each other, maybe they don't. But as we continue to light up the night and disconnect from that source of inspiration, how can we tell these stories to inspire us again? I know I'm preaching to the choir. But um, John Keats, my favorite poet, in his poem Lamia, was lamenting in this particular stanza the fact that Newton had really basically destroyed the rainbow by reducing it to data. Do not all charms fly at the mere touch of cold philosophy. He's just trying, he, he wrote a letter about this particular poem and said, you know, the scientists are robbing us of the beauty and the wonder. And not to, to diminish the role that science has to play, but from the poet's <coughs> perspective, it's really hard to try to find the inspiration when we just reduce things to these data points and to things that can be measurable. So I was just recently in Minnesota speaking at the Aurora Summit about the Northern Lights. So this is the goddess Aurora, ancient goddess of the dawn. She's one of the titans. And this is Boreas, the god of the winds. Now Aurora, who was Eos to the uh, Romans, she consorted with Astraeus, son of the titan Creus and daughter of Pontus the sea, guy of the earth, and they gave birth to the winds and the stars. Now it's Galileo in the 1600s who's the first person to use the term Aurora Borealis, to describe the Northern Lights. It's a phenomenon that they were trying to get a hold of. There was some idea about what it was causing, what was causing it, but the concepts about the Earth's place in space really informs that idea. So when you fast forward to where we are now, again, if you Google this, the Northern Lights are bright dancing lights. Um, they're actually collisions between electronically par charged particles from the sun that enter the Earth's atmosphere. They're seen above the magnetic poles. Okay, so this is a, you know, the data as far as we can determine. Welcome, come right on in. As far as we can tell what's causing the aurora, this is a way to describe it. But what the former culture saw, you know, these beautiful clouds with candlelight above with the stars. I mean, this is like an active imagination about what is that phenomenon that we're seeing? And you could say that maybe in the 1500s that was kind of a scary time to be trying to imagine what's happening in the natural world, but at the same time it's really rich with an imagination that gives an expression of the feeling life toward our place as human beings relative to the dark. The, may I ask a question? Yes. The, the idea that Aurora Borealis became less beautiful when it was understood, as you referred to before, is that popular? Is that a popular idea? Is that expressed popularly more than what you, I'm saying right what now? You said? 
Um, I would say that there are people who have that sense. There are, I have only met one person in my life who was terrified of the Northern Lights. I know that there are indigenous cultures that believe that the Northern Lights are the souls of their dead, and they don't rush out to see them, they go hide. Um, so it's not necessarily that they're saying, you know, this deconstruction of the mystery through data removes the mystery of it. I think that people still have a sense of awe and wonder regardless, you know, whether you can describe the data or not. So what I'm after is just saying what, what's happening in our cultural life when we, when we can get this data. What kind of art are we creating out of that? When you look, my next slide is just a, an excerpt of a poem by Robert Service, The Ballad of the Northern Lights where he's describing not this beautiful thing, but it's a dragon. Is this the one, Wallace? Yeah, Robert Service. So that we have this idea, like, you've got to get out and see this phenomena. But there was a time when, yeah, it wasn't such a great thing to see Northern Lights. It was an ill omen. And so we've really shifted in our perspective about things. So that's what I'm trying to describe. And I, can, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I know that my standing heavily on the side of the poets and the humanities it's not like, let's not try to figure it out. It's more, how can we continue to celebrate the mystery of it? Do we always have to be unveiling the mystery? And have we actually found the answer? Is it still something that eludes us? And can we be OK with not answering that? So he's explaining that, you know, the sky was a pit of veil and dread. A monster reveled there. So I was just, as I said, in Minnesota with the Aurora Summit. And this, uh, I, I pulled up all these poems about how there's this description. This is from Wallace Stevens, who lived in the 1950s. This is where the serpent lives, bodiless. His head is air. Beneath his tip at night, eyes open and fix on us in every sky. He's giving a really elaborate description of a dragon. And there was a man named Bob Kelly sitting in the audience. He said, yeah, I have seen that. Look at this. Whoa. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I asked him. There was like a room full of photographers. They were all there to figure out, like, how can I find out when it's going to be active? Where do I need to go? What camera equipment do I need? And I said, has anybody experienced the dragon? And his guy was like, yeah, I've seen that. And he had this amazing photograph. So I asked him if I could use it for this presentation. He was formerly the director of a wonderful planetarium down in Texas. So he did write a story about this. So it's still inspiring people. Yes, go ahead. Having only seen them faintly from uh, Oregon and in the dark skies, cameras capture them like this. I mean, you you live further north. How, how he much was he, he was actually in Alaska. This picture. Okay. In Alaska. Yeah, I was just wondering, you know, because it's a very faint thing, and unless you know what you're looking at, you wouldn't even mod. They can it get up. that bright. I mean, they can cast the shadows. The further north you go, this is a person that he said, "I don't do a lot of post photo production." He doesn't like to do too much filtering. You know, they do some white balance, they do some noise. So I've always wondered because you know we yeah. get on all he we see the photographs, but they're photographs. Yeah, so he definitely had not only did he see this afterward when he looked at his picture, he described it that he was having the sensation as of a dragon yeah. coming kind of serpent teeth. And you do make an eye seeing the and, dance. And, right, and part <laughs> of what's happening is they're happening in the north where the constellation Draco the Dragon is. It never sets, it's always there. And so Wallace Stevens in his Auroras of Autumn is actually describing that. Like we might see these shimmering lights, but that's actually the dragon getting activated. And in the 19, well he was, I think in the 1950s he wrote that poem. He's still trying to access this concept that isn't deconstructed by the data. So to really have a story to tell, even a make-believe, but just to say, you know, there's a quality here that we don't want to overlook. And how do we... What I'm really interested in is how, if we're not having this part of the conversation, how do we keep that, that part of our cultural life enriched? Because we, we can deconstruct things. We, do, we, do, we use telescopes, we use microscopes, but we're living in this environment where we have to make choices about the quality of our life. So is it getting brighter or darker? You could ask that question and measure the data, and that's about the quantity of light and then you could turn, turn it to brighter or darker in our experience, and that's about the quality of life. And so, is the storytelling helped or hindered by our current description of the phenomena? And maybe that's not even the right question, but I'm always poking at that. Like when we say that that way, 
What story can be built out of that? And what story will future generations witness in us? Because there's nothing more true than that future generations are going to discover something different than what we ourselves know and understand to be truth and fact. And they'll say, gosh, you used to believe in these things. Like we say, we used to believe in dragons. But here's an expression of a dragon. Maybe a dragon wasn't a, like, you know, a creature walking around on the earth like a raccoon, but something that appeared and then disappeared. It kind of came out of the veil and then went away. And but, what does that do? But, but if you acknowledge that the scientific understanding of it will be upended yes. every decade, yes. then it's not being deconstructed. It's being True. deconstructed into a different mythology. True. And we don't know. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I could see that as 10 years as a director of a dark sky park, it got to be really like a, there's a mania around Northern Lights. I can't tell you huh. how many times in one day, over an entire 10 year period, I had to answer the question, when can I see the Northern Lights? And it's like, can you just dial that up for me? I actually had a woman call me. I'm the assistant, assistant of Mrs. Smith. She's going to be on Mackinac Island on next Tuesday. She'd like to know what time I can schedule her to come see the Northern Lights. And I was like, I hope okay. you gave her a time. <laughs> I mean, I could tell by the way she asked the question. It's like, you really, there's no thought happening in you around what you just asked me. I was on the other end of the phone like, <laughs> I don't know quite how to give you the information that you're going to hear that you can give to this person. You know, and it's, it's really challenging. So yes, it's going to keep changing, but in the immediate moment, it's crazy. We used to, I went from being like, okay, I'm an authority, people are going to ask me this question to, wow, this is crazy the number of people asking the question to every time space weather would announce an alert that there might be an aurora, I would pray for rain. <laughs> and I'm not kidding because it is that it's like it like there's a mania about the phenomenon. People just show up in droves. They don't don't make me think. I just want to see it. So that's yeah yeah yeah. Did the Northern Lights got that off my bucket list? Okay, so to get to um, kind of the simultaneity of things, Pablo Picasso, right? <laughs> King Oliver and Edwin Hubble. So they were all born in the 1880s, and each one of them was an innovator in their field. Pablo Picasso introduced cubism. Oliver King is somebody who was, can you read any of that? Sorry that it's so small. So uh, King Oliver was somebody who was really instrumental in the beginning of jazz. You can't really say, okay, this one person did this thing. But what all three of these men were doing was picking up, I think, on an impulse that was arising. And it wasn't something that was just, woo, back up. What happened? OK, sorry, I'm going to escape and go right back to that slide. Don't look at the next one. <laughs> Wait for me. <coughs> Got to do it all again. I apologize. I don't know how it did that. Bumped itself out of there. Hello, Benny Maya. So each one of these men was instrumental in I think giving expression to a cultural impulse in the world of astronomy, in the world of music, in the world of art. The galaxy and the Andromeda region, this nebula over there, that might be another galaxy. Like this is a mind expanding thought. And he's doing that work in research in the 1920s. The idea that there are other galaxies is not no, it's not provable yet. We're still operating with the concept less than 100 years ago that the Milky Way is the only galaxy. And Edwin Hubble is like, wait a minute, there are other galaxies. Now we know, you know, there are who knows how many other galaxies. Because of the technology we've been able to create, we can know that now. But at that time, that was new. Just at the same time that this new impulse is coming in music, jazz. Just at the same time that this new impulse is coming in art, Cubism. Like these things are shaking up the accepted, the, the status quo. It's like, no, things can be a lot different. And Picasso doesn't necessarily have to know what Edwin Hubble is doing. And maybe they both like jazz music. But it's not, again, it's not this causal relationship. But the simultaneity of it suggests to me that something rises up in humanity. And depending on your discipline and your interest, you're expressing it in a certain way. 
And when the astronomers describe their discovery, the language they use to describe it might possibly be informing the way we give expression to our art or the way we give expression in our music. And this idea that there are other galaxies, did that in any way affect what the kind of, at first had to be really odd experience of cubism or these syncopated beats coming through jazz music. I mean, it's really changing at that time. So that's what, as a storyteller, and trying to look like, what, what, what's going on? Is there, are there other ways that we can see something that's happening in the phenomena of discovery that isn't just in the world of astronomy, but it's happening at the same time that new ideas are being introduced? So this is an artist mm -hmm. rendering of the, what's called the, um, in four billion years, it's predicted that the Milky Way galaxy is going to collide with the Andromeda galaxy. Okay, so Edwin Hubble sees it, he says, yeah, that's a galaxy, and now there's this idea that these two galaxies are going to collide. Um, so it's the Andromeda Milky Way collision, and it's predicted to occur in about four billion years, but now, rather than saying, okay, they're just gonna smash into each other, now the astronomy community is saying, the stars in each galaxy are so far apart from one another that none of the stars are really gonna hit each other, but there's still this description that this collision is gonna take place. And then also the idea that at the center of every galaxy, there's a black hole. And I'm not saying these things aren't true. I'm just saying that this is a picture that we have right now. You know, they didn't have this concept 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago, many, many centuries ago. But this is a picture that we're working with now. And these are both artist renderings of this idea. Milk galaxies collide. There are black holes that devour things that are at the center of every galaxy. You don't go near it because not even light can escape. So me not being a scientist, just trying to listen, like, what are you saying? Okay, that's a scary place. I don't want to go there. Like, we don't want our planet or our galaxy or our system to orbit too close to that, because then we're gone. <laughs> and it doesn't matter to me if it's four about billion years from now, because that's an immediate thought, and I'm like, ooh, don't want that to happen. And then it pushes me into having to consider, well, what's going to happen when I die anyway? <laughs> and where did that come from? Like, what is all of this? And how do we give expression to that? The ancients believed, okay, it doesn't exist unless it's within the soul of you, oh human being. You come from it, you go back to it. And this process of being devoured or colliding is actually part and parcel of your own becoming. And maybe it's not just this violent transformation, but this awesome enlightening experience. So again, just going on Wikipedia, black hole is a region of space-time exhibiting such strong gravitational effects that nothing nothing can escape, you know? I'm getting the trauma of it, like, whoa! Mm -hmm. So, let's go back and tell the story of the woman in chains. Here is mm -hmm. a beautiful drawing of the constellation of Andromeda. Okay, you could say, all right, this has got nothing to do with me, but you could also say, maybe my environment extends as far as I can see. Now I can see, you know, the edge of the horizon, I can see the sky, and actually with my own two eyes, I can see the Andromeda galaxy. So all of it belongs to my environment. So this, her story is part of the story of humanity. And so her story is what the ancients believed, was that her mother, Cassiopeia, offended the god of ocean by saying that she was more beautiful than the daughters of ocean. And so she should have known better as a queen, she should have known you don't offend the divine by elevating yourself above it. And so she was forced to sacrifice her daughter, Andromeda, who had nothing to do with the events, to the ocean beast, Cetus the whale. Okay, so she's chained there to the rock, and Cetus is on his way to devour her. Now, Cetus is born out of the Pontus region of the Black Sea. And it has a reputation for being this black, roiling region where monsters are born, devouring monsters. Don't want to go near it, because you're going to get devoured. And if these things come after you, you know, they're going to just like slam in, and then that's it. But what the Greeks built into this story, there's a subplot happening in another part of the sky where the hero Perseus has most recently slain the Medusa, the Gorgon who has snakes for hair, who, if you look directly at her, will turn you to stone because the Greeks said, you know, the Egyptians used to do this initiation process, and if you got enlightened, you got that snake at the top of your headdress. We don't do that anymore. If you take that path, you're going to turn to stone. So this is one culture denying the initiation wisdom of a former culture and telling their story and saying, all right, if you do that, you're going to turn to stone. But we've got this hero, the hero of the human spirit, Perseus. 
He's a half-blood, so his mother is a human being, his father is Zeus. So he's sent on this mission, and then he's flying to the sky on the winged white horse Pegasus. He sees Andromeda chained to her rock. He swoops down with the head of the Medusa, turns the ocean beast Cetus to whale, the whale to stone, and then frees her, and then they live happily ever after, which is uncharacteristic for the Greeks. <laughs> <laughs> you could say that this story is not a real far cry from what contemporary astronomy says. The Milky Way galaxy is going to collide with the Andromeda galaxy. That this is the picture. And at the center of every galaxy, there's this devouring thing from which nothing can escape. But what the Greeks built right into their story was this intervening hero of the human spirit. They were saying, you know what, human being? You're part of the narrative. The story you tell is how this is going to end. And so for me, as a storyteller and a poet, it's like, all right, when you tell me, astronomy community, that galaxies are cannibalistic, that black holes devour things, like what is that doing for our happily ever after that might, could, you know, maybe that could happen. How do I participate in that? And if I feel cut off from it, like random asteroid strikes are a thing and there's nothing I can do to protect myself except, except for support the decision to spend billions of dollars creating a shield and an alert system so that if it starts to happen, I can go run for cover somewhere and we can try to push it out of the way. I mean, this is, this is real and I don't want to make light of it, but it's informing our decision making. And if we are cut off from our knowledge of the night sky and the cultural history of it by light pollution, by lack of education, by an unwillingness, then we're going to make different decisions. And so for me, the role of the storyteller in dark sky advocacy is really, really important because we need to take ourselves to task about the story we're telling in our contemporary understanding of what's going on because this was real and true for the ancient Greeks. We could say, well, look what happened to them, except we could say this is an unfolding we continue to become, and where is Perseus? Not as an individual out there, but in each of us. Where is that hero that's willing to stand up and say, you know, I can see that the data is pointing to that, but as an active participant in what's happening here, I'm thinking maybe I could make it go this way. I could make a diff different decision. We could arrive at something else. We could risk ourselves and sing a song to a group of scientists and say, you know what, it's changing. We've got to get hold of it and do something else. So I think that I've got, um, I'm talking really fast, so I apologize. Uh, this is just part of the, the story that, you know, Perseus says, these are not the chains you deserve to wear, but rather, rather those that link fond lovers together. So she should be chained to a rock, but she should be joined with him. You know, I mean, love and beauty, it's not a hellish thing. I mean, we have that experience that love can be hellish, but it doesn't have stop, to be. Do you ever stop at that point and say, hashtag me too? I mean, it's, a, it's a little sudden. I, I, he, I mean, he, he shows up and takes her away. They don't know each other. So, you, this is an so I would say that that's an application of contemporary thought on an ancient expression of something that doesn't play out the same way, like the way we think of it. So Perseus isn't just the man. It's that in each of us that rescue. I mean, Andromeda represents the soul nature of the human being. The feminine in the ancient cultures and fairy tales is always the soul. Males have souls just like females have souls. So that battle and that attempt to free and then unite, it's a spiritual battle. And it's happening within the individual. So it isn't the men got to show up as Perseus and the women, poor things, are chained to rocks. No, no, no. It's that All the characters are one. One. Are, are one. one. Okay. You are Andromeda and Perseus, as am I. And how do I awaken that part of myself that can actually say, yeah, no, you don't have to be chained. I mean, to be chained to a rock on the earth is to express a belief only in this world. And the idea that something's coming from beyond the time and space. It's of a spiritual nature. You can't define it by the laws of time and space. But it enters in and unites with this. I don't have a slide for it, but if you look at Hercules, the constellation Hercules, not an easy constellation to find if you don't know the night sky because the stars there are not that bright. He's coming in upside down. And he's on bended knee. He was known as the kneeler before he was identified as Hercules or Heracles. And so part of his story is that as he's on his way to the 11th labor, which is to get the golden apple from the garden of the Hesperides, 
he encounters Antaeus. Antaeus is a giant. And Antaeus is, he lives in a region like I think that we would consider Libya today. He's the son of Gaia, the earth. And his secret power is that as long as he remains connected to the earth, he's stronger than anyone that he encounters. And you can't go through that region of the earth unless you wrestle with him. So Hercules has no choice but to go through this region of the earth, and so he's got to wrestle with Antaeus. Guaranteed Antaeus is going to win, except Hercules is starborn. Even though he's got a human mother, he's somebody that is representing the higher nature of the human being. And he knows, all i got to do is pick Antaeus up, off the earth. Don't have to do anything else, just lift him up. Lift yourself up, O oh human being, and that lower nature will no longer have control over you. So he lifts Antaeus up, Antaeus struggles, he dies, and Hercules is able to go on. In the Renaissance, there was an artist by the name of Antonio. Antonio, I want it to be Paolo, but it's not. It's, it, there's a couple extra syllables in there. He was the first one to do a sculpture in the round of a mythology. And he shows Hercules holding Antaeus up. And Antaeus's leg is kicking out. If you turn the sculpture upside down, it's the constellation Hercules. And then you realize that what's hidden there is not one figure coming in upside down, but two figures. One being held upside down, and the other one trying to awaken. So it's this fascinating way of looking at how the ancients spoke in these kind of archetypes about the true nature of being human. They believed each one of us comes from a star, not you're made of star stuff. A star went through its you know, life cycle, it exploded, the elements are cast out into space, and then they really abbreviating this, but coalesce much later as life as we know it. Here we are. It's that you incarnate from a particular star, you pick up the forces for this form from the fixed stars of the zodiac, the rhythmic organization of the, the inner organs from the, the planets. Then you unfold your biography on the earth and when you're done you go back to that star and inform that star world what is it to be a human being. This is a totally different picture. So the ancients are like, okay, you're coming in and you've got to remember that you're gonna there's this part of the process of coming in where you've got to forget where you came from but then you have to awaken it. And so they're continually telling this story. How do we wake it up? How do we wake it up? How do we wake it up? And you could, if you say, okay, here we are, 21st century. Are we, what are we doing to wake, awaken that? Or maybe it's a crazy thought. Are you kidding me? come from a star. Or you could say, wow, if that's true, it must be knowable. If it's knowable, then how do I find out? Well, if I can't get access to the night sky, then chances are I'm not gonna be able to figure it out. Having that regular experience that long to humanity for centuries, just surrendering to the awe and the mystery and the wonder of the sky. We're bereft of that in most of our environments. So, dark sky and Vicky's <laughs> We have literally lost sight of it. Right. So to end with my favorite quote by Rudolf Steiner, one of my favorite quotes, not just by him, but favorite quotes. The more abundantly the harmony of the cosmos fills the soul, the more peace and harmony there will be on the earth. So notice this isn't the more abundantly the violet descriptions of what we think is out there fill the soul, but the more abundantly the harmony of it, the rising and setting of the sun, the waxing and waning of the moon, the stars in their season. This is a harmony. And though we can, we, we have witnessed things that we describe now as collisions and you know the dark matter, these things that we use a language that can be kind of violent, and I'm not denying that that is so, but there's some part of our expression of the beauty of it that's really, really necessary now. And to be able to witness that is really important. You don't even have to talk about it, but to stand as a witness to that in the world. It's peace work. You know, we all accept that the Earth is orbiting the sun. But we still, at least in the English language, give the verb of motion to the sun. We say, Earth is moving, but the sun is rising, moving overhead, setting in the west. What we see and what we know, they're not the same thing. The concept is, Earth is rotating and orbiting the sun. The perception is, the sun is coming up, going overhead, and setting down. So in that place where the concept and the percept don't match, that's where the mischief gets in. And how do we say what we really mean? We have a responsibility in our language to say what we mean, and we could describe it as a becoming rather than as a violent end. 
If it's always going to be violence at the end, what decisions am I going to make to get them? I'm going to try to resist as much as I can. And I might make different decisions. And if it takes the poets and the musicians and the artists to stand up for that part and try to figure out a way to speak with consequence in the scientific sphere, then that's what has to happen. So that's why I'm here trying to do this thing and trying to you know, give expression to something that I think is fundamentally important to this striving, to awaken us about why does it matter? Why do we need to think about light at night? Why do we need to know the stars? It's part of our own becoming. Okay. 10.57 on the clock. So I raised <laughs> through that. No, you're fine. Um, I'm going to hand it over now to my new friend uh, in, in this time space. Okay, I don't know where the... Don't look at any of the slides yet. <laughs> <laughs> I can do it. Oh, it's not up there yet. No, I so can't. I So I've got you set up there. This is Lori Rader Day, who is a famous author of famous. and recently set her sights on storytelling around dark sky parks. And so she's going to give you, as a, as a published author, this journey of, you know, taking an idea and giving expression to it. So and interestingly, okay. I turned this one right here into a character in my novel. She knows it. It's not a surprise to her right now. Um, she made me a man. I made her a really cute guy. You need a really cute guy. So I write, um, cool. right? I write um, mystery novels. There we go. Um, Under a Dark Sky is my fourth novel. It is, set, it is set in a dark sky park. So I think it might be the first novel ever set in an IDA designated dark sky park. I can't <laughs> confirm that, but I can't find any other person who's done it. I researched very hard before I started writing the book because as soon as I heard about dark sky, sky parks, I thought, what a fantastic place for a murder mystery. Now, <laughs> now you're, you're feeding into the dark is not safe. Yes. <laughs> yes. I understand the problem. <laughs> um, so in mysteries, we're always looking for an interesting place to set crime fiction, because you're trying to do something new, right? There are a lot of tropes in uh, genre fiction, but you're always trying to be better than the tropes. So you're looking for a new character or a new uh, profession for that character to do or a new location. And when I heard about Dark Sky Parks, I thought, ha ha, <laughs> found it. <laughs> and I know that is not what the IDA had in mind when they started their program. But bear with me, because I think it ends well for the park. Okay. So Untitled Number Four, um, that is what the contract said. I had a two book deal with HarperCollins. I had already written and published the first book, or I was about to publish the first book in that contract. So on the contract, it just said Untitled Number Four, which means I did not know a single thing about that book that I had already sold and had a contract for and had a deadline for. Um, but I heard probably a radio story on NPR or maybe something on Facebook about a dark sky park. And it must have been, it might have been the headlands. Um, so it might have been one of your parks. Um, your press releases are working. Because I heard about it and I thought, what a fantastic place for a murder mystery. So, but I just had the twinkle of the idea. It was just all I had was the location. So the way I write is I don't have a goal in mind exactly. I just get a couple of points on the map and I start writing. That's how I work. It is not how everyone works. There's an entire uh, ongoing argument about Plotters versus pantsers. I'm a pantser. That means I write by the seat of my pants. Um, but there are plotters, people who will spend months and months working on an outline, which they then use to write the novel. Six months, maybe, on an outline. Um, I call that mental illness. I would not be able to write for six months and only have an outline um, and then sit down and write the novel. I think um, I would go insane. Um, so I just need a couple points on the map. But why, can you see the, the potential, the story potential in a dark sky park? Even though, yes, I'm, I'm adding to the theory that maybe darkness is scary. But I assume you're going to resolve it. I am going to resolve it. <laughs> so I think the park I heard about was Headlands International Dark Sky Park in Mackinac City, Michigan. I just have a couple of great photos. I just, I love these photos. Uh, Scott Castelline, uh, do you know Scott? I do. Um, that was staged. Gracious, <laughs> I'm sure it was. Are, are you in the picture? 
No, it's him and his mom. Oh, okay. Um, has graciously allowed me to use some of his photos in my presentations uh, that I'm doing for this book launch. So, um, but I always give him credit, and he does fantastic work. Check him out. Um, just, I just brought a couple of pictures along. Now, this is a familiar picture. Do you guys see this picture out on one of the um, yeah, one of the standees, right? Yeah. That's Chicago. That's where I live. I could only see about two stars from where I live. Two. And I'm pretty sure one of them is Venus. Um, so maybe it's one star, and I don't, I don't know what it is. When and she's I, around. She's around. She's up there. Um, but that's, this is what we're dealing with. Um, this is where I live. So I, but I grew up in a dark place. Um, one more too bright photo that I borrowed. Um, and you can actually see the highways going on. It's just amazing. This is unnecessary, I think. Um, I'm on your side when it comes to this. I don't think we need it. I grew up in a dark place. Um, I grew up in central Indiana, um, where if I just looked out my bedroom window, I could see Orion's belt, no problem. I was really into the stars when I was a kid. So coming back to the star stuff is very natural to me. Um, but I had no idea about dark sky parks when I heard about them, and it got my, my story potential going, because that was my first point of the map. Um, the Heavens in the National Dark Sky Park is the closest dark sky park to where I live. It's still about six hours away, but it's the closest designated dark sky park. So it's pretty easy that that would be the one that I would um, want to research because that's the one I wanted. I wanted to go there. I wanted to research it on the ground. Um, it also had a really great website. It had a lot of early <laughs> focus on storytelling. Thank you to this lady right here. They had done so much work to package themselves up to become a dark sky park that was already there. And so it was very easy to start researching the park when I started um, thinking about maybe um, getting up there and writing about it. There's a, another photo. Can you see the, the Mackinac Bridge? Have you guys ever been to the Mackinac Bridge? Mm -hmm. Story potential, because that thing is scary. Um, it moves with the wind. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is, can I? Yeah, this is in. five miles across right here. So yeah. this is the Straits of Mackinac. Mm -hmm. It's about eight miles. This is uh, Bois Blanc Island. This is Round Island. This is Mackinac Island, number one tourist destination in Michigan. Mm -hmm. Yes. This part right here, this little bump, that's headlands. That's the headlands. This is Wilderness State Park. We got like 23,000 acres protected after we got the designation for headlands. That's fantastic. Yeah. And two miles of Lakeshore. Two miles of Lakeshore. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Mackinac Island became part of my research process. I didn't actually put it in the book as it turned out, um, but I did get the bridge in there. Um, a little known secret about Mackinac Island. It smells like horse poop. <laughs> All the time. They don't put that in the brochure, but that is Because really there are no automobiles allowed out there. So they so use horses to draw uh, people up to the hotels and to move you know, all their products around, so it, it, yeah, it has a lot of horses. Um, one more of the headlines, just because he gave me so many great photos to use. I wanted to use. Oh, one more. Um, so I just really wanted to write about this beautiful place, but I needed more points on the map before I could start working. Um, so, so far I have not started writing. I've just got one point on the map location. I don't advise starting a story, a full novel, 400 pages, when you only have location. Um, there's too much room for, uh, too many variables are still open. So the next point on the map is character. Um, for this book, I wanted to write about something that scared me, and so I decided I was going to write about a character who had lost her husband too young. So she's about uh, 35, and her husband has died. It's not a spoiler. That's on the back of the cover of the book. Um, the story starts with um, her arriving at the park. She has discovered a reservation at a dark sky park that her husband left in his effects, um, and she decides to keep it, even though she's actually become a little bit afraid of the dark more enforcing of the bad stuff, but we're gonna get there, I promise you. So that's Eden Wallace. And then the next point of the map was conflict. You know, what is Eden bringing behind her? She's got uh, a dead husband, but that's not, that's not the now story, right? That's not what I'm writing about, because that happened before the story started. So what are we gonna deal with when the story starts? What's the conflict? And I only had the conflict when I started researching on the website for the Headland, Headlands International Dark Sky Park, and they had a guest house. And I thought, that is fantastic. I want to go there. I want to stay there. Uh, I, I really I just want to visit. And so I was trying to figure out 
um, how the reservations worked and how much it cost, and I couldn't figure it out. There was some way that they figured out to list the pricing, and I couldn't figure out if it was by, you'll know, if it was by the person or by the whole house or if it was by the room. You know what I mean? Like, I couldn't figure out, like, if I pay this price, do I get the whole house? <laughs> Or just one, one room, or is it like me and my husband both have to pay? I, I don't understand. I couldn't figure it out. And I thought, oh, okay, okay, that is a potential story problem. If Eden arrives at this actual guest house, and I use the actual guest house, um, and there's a problem there in that she arrives thinking she's getting the whole house, but when she arrives, there are other people there. Um, six strangers who are not getting along. They all know each other, but they're strangers to her. One more. Okay, this is to show you where the guest house is. So, guest house, and then the headlands right there. And then the little headlands. Now, the beach house, they tore that down. Is that right? Yeah. That's where the man I'm happy to do all history of that, but I, it's your. That's okay. <laughs> but uh, they tore it down. Really just they, meeting. And they so. put a fantastic new observatory yeah. and guest um, location. The waterfront a, event center with an observatory. It's beautiful. <laughs> it's beautiful. Um, so it's old now, but that's um, just to show you where the guest house is. Um, I did leave the observatory alone because it was not even open when I started writing mm -hmm. the story, and I thought, okay, they're going to be a little nervous maybe about being named a crime scene to begin with. Mm -hmm. I'm going to leave their observatory alone. I could have worked it into the story, but I did not. So researching the location, I definitely used the IDA website. I used um, park website, as I mentioned, had a lot of information on it. Photos online. So other people who had visited Dark Sky Parks who shared their photos on Flickr. Um, I used photos like that. I bought a trail map um, to see how the park actually operated uh, as just a park, not just a Dark Sky Park, but a park. Um, but my best piece of research were <laughs> YouTube videos <laughs> featuring Mary Stewart Adams. <laughs> so um, these videos, I love these by the way, I watched them all. and. My favorites were the ones with these, what do you call these? What do you call these little standees? So, yeah, if I may. Yeah, so I'm a storyteller. And so we applied to the Michigan Humanities Council to get a grant to create a planetary discovery trail. And they said, wait, planets, why aren't you talking to the Science Foundation? I said, no, 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 we want to tell the story. And so this is Charles Langley. Um, he's a dark sky docent. He lived in the Mackinac area, was a real big change maker in the 1780s. At the same time that uh, William Herschel was discovering the planet, also changed the world of astronomy. So what I was reaching for was how can we make this, the same thing I just did in my presentation. Like here's something going on in the world and how do we localize it to our ex personal experience. And he wasn't a change maker because Uranus was discovered, but that's simultaneous in history. So it gives the kind of, local lore that's contemporaneous with that. Um, but, you know, it's only the outer planets that are discovered. The classical planets are there from the get-go, so the story has to change as you go along. But, yeah, they, there's a whole subculture around how scary these things are at night. They are scary. <laughs> that funny. was not intended. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you, because I use them to much effect in my novel. Because you have these, it, it's a, okay, the park is beautiful, but at night it's the very thin little road that leads and curves back to the waterfront. There's not a lot of room for two cars. So if you see another car coming, of course you have to like negotiate that. Um, meanwhile, these guys are kind of like right off the side of the road, jar <laughs> darting into traffic, right? Um, so as soon as I saw them, I'm like, I'm using those. I don't know what I'm going to use them for, but I'm going to use them. Um, but that's the kind of research that I found on YouTube. The other thing I found on YouTube, um, is so I was looking. I was trying to find like how, what does a park look like from like the very front entrance all the way back to the guest house, and it wasn't the sort of thing I could actually easily find. And I, I was thinking about hiring somebody to go film it for me. And right before, and I had done a lot of research, and I thought I'd seen all that was out there. Um, but right before I tried to find a videographer to hire to go out there, I researched one last time. Just did one more Google search, and I found somebody who had done just exactly the video that I needed. She started somewhere in Canada, so I, you know, half the video is not useful, but if she gets the headlines, she'll, she stops at the gate, the front sign, 
she zooms in, <laughs> she zooms out, she keeps driving. She gets to like one of these guys, stops, zooms in, <laughs> zooms out, keeps her flower, zooms in, I don't know why the flower. Um, but that video was super helpful and completely like, why does that video exist? <laughs> she what story was she mine. wanting to tell? She was a friend of mine. <laughs> was she? She's telling people, here's what Mary's doing. That's awesome. <laughs> I'm trying to get in touch with her. I want to get her book. I can. Okay, yeah. awesome. Thank you. Um, sunrise, sunset checker. Um, my character's afraid of the dark, so I have to keep track of what time it was, what kind of light are we getting, can she even go outside, that kind of thing. But again, back on the ground, research is what I was hoping to do. I just couldn't do it for a very long time. I finally, though, got on the ground. That's me sitting on the, the largest, yeah. the yeah. largest front porch in the world at the um, Grand Hotel in Mackinac. Mm -hmm. Finally got there. Finally got to smell the horse quickly for myself. There's the Grand Hotel. Fantastic place. And then, of course, I mean the Grand Hotel is beautiful, but what I really wanted was to get to that park. So I finally got to go on the ground to be in the park to see what I could, would have gotten wrong. These rules about how you park. To get from that porch to that sign, she had to ride a ferry across the straits. <laughs> and drive a car I mean, just to give you the... Yeah, yeah there's, a, there's a... yeah. Sorry. But it was, but it was such level. fun. It was so great to be <coughs> on the ground there because I had been researching it by that point for about a year. So by the time I actually got to go there, it felt like I'd already been there before. It was amazing. It was great. Um, just a sign from the... But what would have been wrong if I hadn't gone? Because it's possible to write. I think a lot of people do write books where they don't go to the actual place. Or they've been there once, but they, didn't, they don't go specifically researching the book. I wanted to do that. What I would have gotten wrong is this beauty right here. Um, I knew the bridge was there. It's, I'm not dumb. But um, I didn't realize that you can see this thing from like a half a day away. You can mm -hmm. see it approaching Mackinac City from miles and miles and miles. And I didn't know that. I had written uh, my character arriving at the front door of the Dark Sky Park, and, or the guest house at Dark Sky Park, and not realizing she would have already seen the bridge. So later, when she does go on the bridge, that's her introduction to the bridge, right? That would have been wrong. Um, I also had them going through um, oh, Lansing from Chicago. No, yeah. no, that's not right. So Grand Rapids is how you get to, yeah. So I definitely wanted to get things right. And then um, <coughs> came the moment when I realized I should probably tell the headlines that I'm doing this. Um, the book was done, it was turned in, and I need their permission to work, to, to use their part. Um, but I wanted them to be a part of it. I think there's an opportunity there when we're working together, when we can, can share that story. Um, so the one thing I did to protect them, two things I did to protect them, was the name change. I actually changed the name of the park in the book. Why go to all this trouble to do all this research for a very specific part and then change the name? Because I wanted it to be, I wanted it to feel right. I wanted it to feel right to somebody who had been to the headlands. But I also didn't want the headlands to be like, oh great, now we're a crime scene. Um, because it is a murder mystery. Um, and I don't want to feed into the idea that um, darkness means crime. Um, I also, as I said before, did not use the observatory. It was brand new. I don't think it was even open when the book was published. Maybe, maybe it had been open about six months. The guest <coughs> at um, the shop had just opened when the, the book came out. So I didn't want to use their brand new, beautiful, million dollar, millions right. dollar uh, facility um, you know, in this story. So I, I just left it out. I pretended it did not exist. I didn't use the, the beach house either. It's just not there. And then I sent them a cautious email saying, hi, um, I wrote a murder mystery set in your park. Um, I didn't use your name, your park's name, but I do thank you in the acknowledgement, so it's very easy to see that it is your park I'm writing about. Um, if this worries you, ignore it. You don't have to say a word, you don't have to say, you know, you don't have to do anything. Just ignore it, but I wanted you to know. However, if you think there's an opportunity here, let's work together. And to their credit, they were really excited about it. So 
I visited for their proceed, how do you say, proceed meteor shower, proceed meteor shower. Uh, they had a thousand people on the grounds and I was one of their three keynote speakers that weekend. So they embraced it because they saw the opportunity of the storytelling, even though it is not the ideal story for them, they still saw the potential of that story being about them and sharing it with their patrons. Here's a, I don't know this woman. Um, she bought my book at the event and then promptly went out and waited for the darkness reading it. People are not scared by crime fiction. The people who love crime fiction, they're not gonna be scared off by it. In fact, I have talked a lot of people into coming to the dark sky parks. So um, that's a cake that somebody made <laughs> for my launch party. Um, I've been, uh, this book came out August 7th, so I've been working the grounds, getting people under the stars. This is a star party that I threw at my cousin's barn. And this guy here talking to me is a dark sky photographer that lives in my hometown in Thorntown, Indiana. And so we talked about dark sky photography and just being outside in nature. He's also, I didn't know this until I um, got him to come do this event with me, but he actually works for the coroner's office. You'd think that would have come up <laughs> um, before the event, but it did not. Uh, I learned about it just before the, the event, but we had star cookies and Milky Ways and Starbursts and um, cosmic brownies and some, all, the, all the star foods. Um, and then this is an excuse to show my cute nieces. They're just cute. Um, they've got star balloons there. And then, um, you know, it wasn't all star parties, but I have been taking the stars out to the people doing a presentation very much like this with pictures by Scott Castellan and others. That's actually um, me talking to a library in Indiana. Um, but the picture, which is a little hard to see, is the new guest center at the Headlands. Um, me on TV. Um, and then I spoke to the dark sky community in Beverly Shores in Indiana. It's the only dark sky anything in Indiana at the moment. Um, so I've just been moving around talking to lots of people. I've been talking to Michigan quite a bit. This is me laughing my butt off. Um, somebody was trying to teach me how to do the two-handed Michigan <laughs> mitten. I had been doing this very proudly, yeah. getting my mitts on, <laughs> right? Like my one-handed mitten. Finally got it right. It, oh, the, the park is up here, right? <laughs> And then someone's like, well, you know how to do the two-handed mitten. And I'm like, I do not. So they're trying, we'd all had a little drink for dinner. So this is the result. I can do it now. So manicure out, manicure out. Got it, right? Boom, two-handed Michigan mitten. Um, and this is also me signing books at the Grand Hotel on Mackinac Island. I said yes to Michigan, Michigan quite a bit, actually. <laughs> These are my souvenirs. Actually, yesterday I was wearing that sweatshirt. Um, and also, I buy books like this all the time. The local crime stories of the place. This, that's my souvenir everywhere I go. I haven't found one about Utah yet. So why tell the dark side story? story? I just thought it had a lot of potential. That's all I'm looking for. I'm looking for a story that my readers are going to be engaged with. And, and that's really up to me. That has nothing to do with the dark sky aspect of thing. But, Every time I say, I've written a novel, and it takes place in a dark sky park, and then I launch into what a dark sky park is, because not everybody knows yet. You guys are working on it. I know you are. Um, people get really excited. They love it. They love the idea of a dark sky park. And they all want to go. So I have become a little pseudo mini expert in your dark sky. <laughs> and a presentation that was not given to dark sky experts, I would have more information about uh, light pollution and why we should care. Um, I took those slides out for this one, because you guys know, or you've been listening to it all weekend. <laughs> I don't need to tell you. Um, but every time I go and talk to another group, another person goes. This is a photo from my sister, who stopped at the Headlands with, the, with her family on the way back from vacation in Canada, I guess. Um, I'd never heard of this. You know, would not have gone through there it's not exactly on the way to anything, right? So she uh, made a point to go over and, and see what it's about. Lori wrote a book about this place. Let's go see it. And this is another woman uh, reading my book at the Headlands new facility. Um, this is my friend Melissa's mother. They were doing a road trip, and they had to stop at the Headlands because I wrote a book about it. And they wanted to see what a dark, and they, they actually stayed for darkness and, and saw the Milky Way and had a great time. 
Um, these are not the only people, and I've, I've gotten lots of texts of people telling me that they, they went, they went, they went to the headlands, or they, they can't wait to go to uh, Cherry Springs in Ohio, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. They can't wait to go to you know all these places. They they want a park in their state. So I think there is some value in any kind of story, any story that engages people with the idea of the dark skies when they weren't engaged before. The average person doesn't think about light pollution, but even a story about a murder can engage a new group of people, and then they want to hear more about it. They want to learn more about it. Um, that's the end of my slides. I think we have time. Yeah, we have a little for bit of time, um, maybe about 20 minutes, if we want to take that much time for a question and answer, both with Lori and then both yeah, with both, both of us. us. Uh, so I'm just wondering if you um, 